Hi everyone um, and welcome to the first in a series of events programmed by myself and Imani Robinson called Abolition in Defense of Translation at Somerset House as an offshoot of the Revolution is Not a One-Time Event series initiated by myself, Sarah Shin and Che Gossett last year. Broadly, Renote emerged from a desire to bring together theorists, um, art practitioners, organizers to respond to the urgency of the moment and the calls for abolition happening across the world in the wake of riots, uprisings and resistance to prisons and policing. Abolition in defense of translation poses a number of questions. How might we think of the applicability of resistance against landscapes of entrapment birthed by racial capitalism in our everyday lives, no matter who we are and where we are situated? What is it about abolition that makes it such a sticky concept? How do we escape the trap of legibility and the subsequent unspecified parceling out of this concept and practice across the world? What would it mean if we refuse to assume that carcerality looks and functions the same in every context? What about the prison in our local area, in our community, if we focused our attention there? what histories, echoes, and repetitive cycles of extraction and exploitation might be revealed? What can the local tell us about the global? To help us think through these ideas, we gave three abolitionists working across different geographical locations and contexts a prompt and asked them to respond to one another. Um, our contributors for this session are Dr. S.A. Smythe, uh, who is a poet, translator, and assistant pro professor of Black European Cultural Studies, Contemporary Mediterranean Studies, and Black Trans Poetics at the University of California, Los Angeles, uh, where they research relational aspects of Black belonging beyond borders. They are the editor of Troubling the Grounds, Global Configurations of Blackness, Nativism, and Indigeneity, Special Issue for Postmodern Culture, and the forthcoming book, Where Blackness Meets the Sea, on Crisis, Culture, and the Black Mediterranean. June Pang is a writer, researcher, and organizer focusing on migrant uh, rights, policing, and building solidarity across transnational contexts. And Dr. Zoe's Mudzi is a writer whose work has appeared in The New Inquiry, Verso, The Republic, Daily Beast, Art in America, Raw Magazine, Teen Vogue, uh, Black, and other outlets. Her research analyzes German colonization, colonial biomedicine, and the genocide against Hero and Namba and San people in Namibia and its scientific afterlife. Uh, along with William C. Anderson, she is the co author of As Black as Resistance Finding the Conditions of Our Liberation, which was published by AKA Press, and she's currently a research fellow with Political Research Associates. So we've asked them to reflect on the following set of ideas. In defense of translation, when a word or concept travels, its meaning and applicability begin to shape shift. We have seen how abolitionist practices and processes morph depending on geographic location, how the concept has been adapted to the shape of casuality across the world. We have also seen how abolitionist demands have been defanged, twisted and misread against the desire to own and impose a static meaning on abolitionist practice, we work in defense of translation. In the defense of the idea that concepts are not geographically bound, that they can and should float, bend and be utilized by organizers across the world. Abolition is a wandering concept. It is, a solid, it is solid enough to survive transit. It does not flow in one direction, namely from the West outward. Rather, it operates multidirectionally, multi creating new dimensions for exchange. We are interested in tracing carcerality across a number of different contexts. We stand in defense of translation because we eschew the border. So our first uh, person that we're gonna be hearing from today is Zoe, um, so I will let I come onto the screen. Hi, Zoe, and I'm um, over to you. So good to see you both. Um, oh, yeah, I just have some some quite kind of short thoughts. Um, I think that any you know political translation that I attempt at the moment has to begin with what has turned into my retreat into or embrace of nihilism. You know, maybe optimism is something for the naive idealists or the vainglorious privileged or the hubristic believers in meritocracy. Maybe it's a part of the delusional mythos that the good will inevitably get what they deserve. 
um, a kind of appropriation of the divine ordinance that the blessed downtrodden meek will eventually inherit the earth. But I think that optimism, you know, some belief that the royal collective we are better than this, could ever be better than this is really not for me. I can't and won't try to speak for everyone, but I can confidently say three things for myself personally. That to be black and to be hopeful is to be amnesiac, a historical, ahistorical, or a liar. To be black and hopeful is to be masochistic, to almost find pleasure, um, an almost pleasurable refuge in perpetual disappointment. To be black and hopeful feels like a placement of blind faith in the lie that progress is somehow forward moving and linear, that the moral arc of the universe, although long, bends forward and in the direction of justice. So I know that there's a whole tradition of black nihilism um, in relation to Afro-pessimism, but I'm not really trying to get into that now. But we mustn't confuse nihilism for some kind of disposition, even a naggingly persistent one. Optimism connotes and implies some hope and faith in existent systems, communities, and structures, I think. It implies the potential for diversity and the belief in inclusion, for expansion and change and forward moving only linearity. But nihilism, as its opposite, isn't a succumbing to hopelessness. It isn't a belief in life's meaninglessness or valuelessness or purposelessness. I think it's paradoxically an embrace of boundless potential and imagination. More clarifying for me than um, the nebulous and very loaded nihilism is the maybe even more loaded anarchy and perhaps abolition. I saw something recently and I've been reading a lot of terror management theory, which talks about the ways that, or the methods and the ideas that we use to kind of mediate our anxieties about mortality. And I was reading probably some Buddhist thing that was talking about acknowledging mortality isn't fatalism, right? That life remains rich even after you accept its inevitable end. Rich Blint said something about uh, liberation and real change coming from the end of safety, from the annihilation of the familiar identities of race, in the legible, albeit violent and unequal social systems of our selfhoods and personhoods or lack thereof that we're fixed into. Political optimism, I think, is a deplorable weightlessness or weightiness. It's the, um, it is a, it's a notion of safety and a desperate tethering to what is and what has to continue to be. It is, it is actually the dispositional burden and affect and personality to which we're wedded a performance of in relationship to our own humanity, a crushingly disappointment commitment and exercise. It's not unlike unrequited romance, a love to which we're so deeply dedicated, but so frequently offers us little to nothing in return. Is it really better to have loved and lost than to have never loved at all? What would it mean to embrace the end of the world? Obviously not a kind of end, fatalistic end of the material world and the succumbing to the inevitability of the ongoing ecological crisis, which is in fact preventable, but the apocalypse of our already apocalyptic human condition. Apocalypse from the Greek apocalyptain means to uncover or to reveal. It is a revelation of truth and the end of the world then is a matter of perspective. It is the end of the settler world and not the end of the world. The pending apocalypse, the end of the Anthropocene is the end of coloniality and of a modernity shaped entirely by Eurocentric violence. The apocalypse of the apocalypse, the end of the centuries long systematic destruction and enslaving and forced migration of indigenous worlds in service of a thriving white futurity. The end of the world is the end of the so-called human not simply our homo sapiens species, but the epistemic artifice that birthed the social and cultural and economic assemblage that centers the human as a particular kind of white European and hierarchizes all others beneath it. The Anthropocene, obviously, as we know, is defined, is a modernity defined by chattel enslavement, by Columbus's cue to wreak genocidal havoc, which has itself been apocalyptic. The end of the world is the end of this anti-native, anti-black apocalypse, but at tremendous cost. To then embrace a refusal, refusal of the unimaginative confines of this world, what this world could be and what our world ought to be. As Badur Alagra writes in her writing on the interminable catastrophe, quote, we would need to unseat all manner of genre thinking in order to move outside of this overdetermined frame 
be it man or the anthropogenic lens. Because of the durability of this master script concerning our planetary presence, catastrophe is currently understood as one or a series of disastrous events rather than as a symbolic material structural imposition or foundational politic or political concept and colonial modernity. So optimism, I think, is the heaviest of burdens because we cannot unshackle ourselves from imposing moral frameworks and values and priorities, but the reckless abandon and the world-making potential of abolition is lighter than air. I mean, although it's incredibly heavy and it's incredibly cumbersome, it is the kind of the beautiful potentiality that every day we are striving towards, that every day we are building piece by piece by piece. Abolition's most useful function is to, release, is to, is to assist in releasing ourselves of the constant disappointment when we disabuse ourselves of the idea that there's any hope of belonging as citizenship, as freedom making. You simply live to live on your own terms and the terms of your community unconcerned by demands to perform grace, forgiveness, humor, quiet, entertainment, generosity, humility, or undeserved conciliation and reconciliation. There's no singular apocalypse in the biblical sense. William Blake assimilates the apocalypse and its attendant revelations, secular and divine and otherwise, into the everyday. Abolition, too, is not an arrival point on the horizon, but rather an everyday materialization of, to take from Kiguro Macharya, the otherwise. A couple of months ago, he asked us, what might we need to imagine otherwise? Whose otherwise invites you? And how does your otherwise invite others? Thank you. Thank you so much. That was for me, Zoe. Thank you so much. Let's invite now um, June. Um, first, I just want to say thank you so much to Lola and Imani for organizing this and to my co-panelists. Um, it's truly a privilege and honestly quite um, nerve-wracking to be sharing space with people whom I've learned and continue to learn so much from. Um, so thank you for that. And thank you, Zoe, for, for those remarks. Um, I think this is a butchering of what you said, but um, what you said about abolition assisting us in kind of releasing ourselves from you know, the confines of what currently exists and disappointment and overdetermination is something that really resonates with me and something that I'll actually be talking about as well. Um, so I'm going to be speaking about abolition in relation to Hong Kong, which is where I'm from and which has been fundamental to my ways of thinking about the world. Hong Kong for me is particularly helpful to think about, think about and with, um, given its perpetual position as an interface for the development of global capitalism and geopolitical exploitation and overdetermination in many ways. Um, in particular, I'll be focusing on the 2019 um, anti-extradition law uprisings, but also thinking broadly about the city's history and current political context. To start, um, we have all been asked to speak in defense of translation in relation to the concept of abolition. And when trying to think about what to say, I thought first about what I think translation means when we're talking about um, transnational solidarity um, and transnational contexts whose foundations are the same violent global structures of colonialism and racial capitalism and violence. I think when we generally think about translation, we might perhaps imagine a finished text that is then rendered again in a different language for a broader audience. And instead, and I think this is crucial as context for what I will be talking about, translation to me means making the common threads between um, different contexts visible to communities who have the same struggles and the same liberatory ends, even though they might look different. For me, the work of translation means the work of making legible these threads to the end of facilitating um, that solidarity. And that's kind of the crux of, of my work. Um, there are three main kind of dualisms that abolition as a concept contends with in Hong Kong. And um, I just want to talk through some of these in the hope that maybe it will be resonant for others who are working kind of across different uh, transnational contexts. First, um, abolition as articulated but illegible, abolition as unfixed but prefigurative, and abolition as repressed but full of potential. And for me, understanding how abolition continues to persist in spite of and in between the cracks of these kind of dualisms um, 
has been a major source of solace for me because it's a testament to kind of the resilient potential um, of liberatory ideas in spite of really difficult circumstances. Um, the first dualism uh, I'm going to talk about is this idea of abolition being articulated, but as yet illegible. In Hong Kong, um, I think it would be fair to say that we don't really have the concept of abolition as such being developed in our literature, our written history, our, our so-called canon. Um, but that doesn't mean that people have not been thinking about and contesting the absolute authority of the law, the very concept of law and order, and the ways that forms the material foundations of structural violence throughout our history. For example, and this is one of the examples I bring up a lot in my work is that um, in 1966, a 27 year old man named So Sao Chung began a hunger strike um, at the Star Ferry Pier in protest of a hike in uh, fare prices that would impose a really substantial burden on workers and working class people. Um, as people congregated outside the entrance of the pier, So was arrested um, by the British colonial police and charged with obstruction and protesters marched to the British colonial government offices and argued that So had been unreasonably arrested. They continued to demonstrate in their masses um, over three nights. And as protests escalated, some began to throw stones and to destroy public property. Um, predictably, uh, riot squads were called in to quell the protests with tear gas, batons, and eventually a curfew. Because in their words, these young people, these young kind of working class men um, were causing trouble. Subsequently, the British colonial government established a commission of inquiry to investigate the causes um, of what it ominously named the Kowloon disturbances. Um, in the context of the fact that the British colonial administration had previously asserted that a political consciousness did not exist in Hong Kong um, and that people were more concerned with their day-to-day -day lives than engagement in politics. Um, the commission would later describe this anti-fair increase movement as a sporadic outburst of anger resulting from, you know, negative attitudes towards the police and the endemic boredom of young people, rather than as a meaningful and significant cry for, for change. But of course, this was their classed and racialized designation, as I've hinted towards, because of this prevailing view that working class Hong Kong Chinese people, men in particular, could not possibly be political subjects at all. And in its closing recommendations, the inquiry proposed the development of social services to foster healthy community spirit. That is presumably to discipline these unruly youths into obedient and productive subjects um, for the British government. Um, reading against the colonial grain though, we see the opposition to the fair increases and the resulting police suppression um, had a broad base of support. More than 100,000 people signed a petition in support of the hunger strike. And um, if we look at the archive of this petition, it contains letters and petitions decrying the police's unaccountable and violent behavior. And notably, people in these letters question who, if anyone, the police were defending um, in, acting, in enacting such a vicious crackdown. Of course, it's worth noting that in subsequent years, the colonial British government introduced the tactics um, it used in Hong Kong to clamp down on these riots in the British metropole and also introduced anti-riot laws in Hong Kong, um, the same which are used in Britain today uh, to clamp down on protest. And so we've seen the continuous deployment of these laws in 2019 in Hong Kong, but also in recent kill the bill mobilizations um, in the UK uh, here in Bristol. Um, and of course, it's uh, impossible to not remark on the fact that the technologies that were used by the Hong Kong police force in the 2019 protests and also um, continuing to uh, clamp down on people's um, right to protests are also sourced from private companies um, in the UK. And so this is another one of those threads that um, is really crucial to resurface um, that connector struggles, this um, enduring impact of and legacy of empire that continues to the present day. But anyway, fast forward um, 50 years from these riots that I'm speaking about now, and after the handover of Hong Kong's formal sovereignty from Britain to China, different communities in Hong Kong have nonetheless continued to call into question the point of the police. Um, and one example is sex workers who have historically 
and continue to bear the brunt of violent, parochial, and patriarchal anti-vice crackdowns. Um, Hong Kong has the highest proportion of female prisoners of the total prisoner population in the world. And academics have pointed out that for migrant sex workers in particular, there is a conveyor belt that takes women from the police station through the courts and invariably to prison. So in 2019, after some um, ostensibly pro-democracy protesters harassed a group of women, accusing them of being prostitutes from the mainland, mainland China, and causing a nuisance in a public park, sex workers asked why they were not seen instead as allies um, in the fight against police brutality, um, given that they bear, are the ones who bear the brunt of anti-vice crackdowns on a regular basis. Um, this is a quote from um, one of the sex worker groups that mobilized uh, in the aftermath of that protest. Um, sex workers asserted their solidarity with the anti-extradition law movement and demanded that protesters redirect their criticism to the unaccountable government, which was failing to listen to popular demands um, and also to kind of, you know, be clear as to who was the target, you know, not people who are actively um, being oppressed by the police, but people who, but the police themselves who are in the service of the state. And of course, still others, um, people in um, ethnic minority communities, as we call them um, in the Hong Kong context, have continually highlighted the racism of the Hong Kong police force. In 2013, I learned the police force conducted 1.6 million spot checks, which is four times the number uh, in London and New York. And this disproportionately targets um, people of color and, and migrant workers in particular. And so we can see how this very malleable concept of criminality has um, changed over time or kind of developed over time, but ultimately is designed, was designed and continues to be designed to protect the interests of capital and whoever is in power. Um, so all this to say, it does not take much effort to find abolitionist perspectives in Hong Kong, but what it does take is a commitment to looking. Um, and I think this is kind of one of the first mistakes people make when looking at um, transnational struggles, um, to start with an assumption that we speak a common language, um, literally, and only looking for narratives in English, but also in thinking that abolition has to look the same way um, and take effect via the same practices and tactics as if solidarity was as easy as a Google search. Um, and what I myself try to learn and develop is that uh, solidarity demands a commitment to listening to the undercurrents that reveal much more about what is happening than the narratives that make the mainstream. Um, the second dualism that I'll be talking about is this idea of abolition as unfixed but prefigurative. And what I mean when I say this is that there is not yet a fixed idea of what abolition would actually mean or look like in Hong Kong. Um, the 2019 protests were a period of continual resistance. While people were originally mobilizing against an extradition law that would allow for people in Hong Kong to be extradited to mainland China, um, over, the, over time, as the police engaged in increasingly violent uh, crackdowns and protests, the movement coalesced around five key demands, um, one of which, uh, which were basically for the government to withdraw the extradition bill, to stop labeling protesters as rioters, to drop all charges against protesters, um, to conduct an independent inquiry into police behavior, and to implement genuine uh, democracy via universal suffrage. Of course, um, these demands are tied to a liberal democratic horizon, um, but I think it's also important to situate this in a political context where structural pressures have shrunk um, Hong Kong people's space to imagine alternative forms of liberation or even self-determination, uh, trapped as they have been um, between great powers, not as a form of excuse, but as an explanation. But I think there is something in the fact that as police brutality escalated and more and more people who were previously shielded from the sharpest edges of the state violence, that is middle-class kind of Chinese Hong Kongers, um, as they came to the realization that the Hong Kong police force um, was not there to protect them, but actually the interests of the state. There emerged quickly this sixth demand um, called disband the Hong Kong police force. Again, the word disband here indicates a reformist kind of tendency, but others in the movement saw potential for this demand to also gesture towards something more transformative. A chant that I much um, 
preferred, I guess, and that resonated with me though, was the chant, no rioters, only tyranny. Um, the reference to riot here refers to the criminal offense of riot, which as I mentioned previously is a colonial era offense that carries a maximum 10 year prison sentence and also is still also used in the UK to like um, prosecute uh, people engaged in uh, various political uprisings. In this slogan though, we can also hear a fundamental refusal to accept the world as it is, uh, designations of criminality, of writing as they are, um, and a diagnosis in some ways of the real systemic roots of oppression. And this is um, the uh, Cantonese um, uh, characters for that uh, slogan. Concurrently, and this is, this is the prefigurative aspect of abolition, what we saw in the streets of Hong Kong during the protests were incredible waves of mutual aid and solidarity, um, online and offline discussions and confrontations between people who were explicit in their repeated assertions of commitment to one another. Um, and this was not unproblemat unproblematic, of course. And in fact, upon reflection, lots of organizers have said that the tendency to strive for unity and to paper over uh, cracks in political position resulted in reactionary politics. I don't want to pretend that this did not happen. In fact, this would do many organizers a disservice to undermine how alienating it was and continues to be to maintain principled leftist perspectives. Um, but what I'm hoping to resurface and surface is that in people's acts um, of caring for one another, whether that was anonymous parents picking up anonymous children, making sure they got home safe after a protest, unnamed donations to legal and health services, unnamed doctors operating underground medical clinics, supply lines passing on water and umbrellas to shield people from tear gas. All of these things were prefigurative, at least in my view, of, of a politics of expansive care that's not dependent on who we are, but how we want the world to be. One where we can all be safe, protected, and also heard in our political ambitions. And that's something that I think for me um, has been uh, really continues to inspire me to continue um, struggling forward. Um, the third kind of idea, and I'm almost <laughs> I'm finished, uh, thank you for bearing with me, is this idea of abolition as repressed um, but still full of potential. Um, and this is a really brief idea and one that I'm still thinking through, but I think um, Hong Kong has wholly changed from when the 2019 uprisings began. Um, the advent of a national security law has resulted in the continual expansion and retroactive even criminalization of, of dissent in many forms, which has resulted in the closure of newspapers, bookstores, the prosecution of opposition politicians, trade unionists, anyone who has ever kind of expressed opposition is, is fair game. Um, many people have left Hong Kong and some have sought asylum abroad. And in fact, it makes me slightly self-conscious to even speak um, about abolition today from the relative safety of where I live now, when I know that such a conversation could probably um, no longer happen in Hong Kong, except maybe behind closed doors. And even then it might put people at risk. Um, if I may be so bold though, I wanna talk about how abolition has again, given me some solace in spite of this the situation. First, um, for all the talk of people leaving, there are many more who will stay, who have no choice but to stay, who are in prison already or who are standing trial, who are continuing to persist, whether in the city or abroad. Um, and there's no shadow of doubt in me that these people will continue in their practices and in the ways that they can to cultivate the conditions within themselves and their communities to instantiate abolition in their daily lives. Um, the horizon may have shifted from kind of the broad political sphere to the minute every day, um, but I have faith that the, the revolutionary potential of that utterance, there are no rioters, only tyranny, is not lost just because its outward performance is now prohibited. People are still writing to imprisoned protesters in prison. People continue to mobilize to keep their communities safe from the police. The key for us abroad is to work harder to resurface these perspectives. And for all of us, wherever we are, um, the key is to develop arguments for why abolition is the only way forward in solidarity with other struggles, rather than giving in to the attraction of reactionary um, politics. Last year, um, in response to the Black Lives Matter uprisings in the US and um, internationally, some Hong Kongers began to um, mobilize in solidarity, trying to make connections between the foundations of 
racial capitalism that undergird these systems. And the key for us will be, in, as Hong Kongers, but also people working in solidarity, will be to continue to sustain um, and feed and nourish these connections. Second, and this is another kind of half-formed thought, is that as more people move abroad, the question of border abolition will become more relevant for our political community. Um, in Hong Kong, the border has always been a site of discipline where citizens are either included or excluded based on markers of race, gender, and class, um, legible as productive members in the economy of a global financial hub or exploited as reproductive labor, ineligible to claim decent wages, housing, or permanent residence, rights that are routinely afforded to other um, mostly white um, foreigners. Um, but as more people become migrants, forced migrants, and begin to encounter the sharp edge of the nation state system in ways that they have not in the past, while also trying to retain some connection to Hong Kong and the community that they have kind of left behind, um, I think and hope that the necessity of reimagining unity beyond territory will lead to more solidarity, not less, um, with other communities that face the sharpest edges of the global system already and have already have done so for for many, many years. Um, to end, I just want to show this video that was shared with me um, by a friend and interlocutor from Lebanon with whom I've been engaged in kind of continual discussions over the possibilities inherent when we look transnationally. Um, it depicts a group of feminists in Lebanon singing a song called Revolution Everywhere. Um, without trying to romanticize this particular moment as representative of kind of a grander narrative, I think what this video shows at the very least that there are, is that there are many more of us trying to make these connections than people who would resist or refuse to acknowledge their very or their even possibility. Um, but I'll leave my presentation and thoughts there and look forward to discussing these ideas with the rest of the panel. Thank you so much, June. That was incredible and so comprehensive. Um, last but not least, we have Essay. Hello. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, a recent project that I'm um, starting to work on with Vanessa Eileen Thompson um, from uh, Frankfurt, Goethe, and soon to be Queen's University in Canada. Um, and I'm really looking forward to um, being in actual conversation. I think that's um, the best part. So this um, past year has asymmetrically thrust the world into unprecedented, quote unquote, conditions that have deepened the need for abolitionist practices, imaginations, and worlds. We've, again, asymmetrically experienced restricted in-person gathering due to the racialized COVID-19 pandemic, which has increased reliance on digital mediums and historic uprising for black life that swept across the United States from the summer of 2020 in a response to the police killings of Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, Tony McDay, Tamad Arbery, and too many others. Um, and also the mainstream circulation of abolitionist thought and practice also so-called unprecedented. Um, and while we're talking about translation, I um, would love to, for us to sort of attend to uh, the meaning of words and how they get unmoored from space as well as from time. Um, North America is of course not an isolated phenomenon, um, not even a singular paradigm of the anti-black violence that shapes the modern world and many of its unfurling inequity. Wherever there are police, there is police murder. Wherever there are police, there is the need and demand for abolition, no matter what name you choose to give it. The ongoing global black uprisings across places like the US and Canada, throughout many countries in Europe and on the African continent, East Asia, the Caribbean and South America, again remind us that black internationalism continues to shape and reconstruct the world in the wake of asymmetrical warfare against the oppressed. These uprisings brought the call and commitment to abolition to the streets en masse, struggling not only for the abolition of police, prisons, detention centers, border regimes, and other repressive and exploitative institutions, but also for the creation of a radically new and different world. 
those of us who study or attend to racialization, migration, and inequity beyond the North American context have long observed that the international dimensions of abolition are either under-addressed or only hailed in dependent and comparative ways, although nothing could be further from the truth. The demonstrations in summer 2020 throughout Italy under the banner of Black Lives Matter recognized the lives of migrants, overwhelmingly of black African descent, struggling for their lives on their journeys across the Mediterranean. Names of immigrants, refugees, and black Italian citizens without papers like Monsieur Emmanuel Kirinandi and others were listed on posters in Rome alongside George Floyd's and Breonna Taylor's. Across cities like Paris and Marseille in France, George Floyd's name was shouted and painted on murals alongside the names of Adama Traoré and Lamina Dieng. Before 2020, collectives such as Ferguson in Paris were founded and connections between the global dimensions of carcerality were emphasized. In Germany, black people and non-black supporters struggle for justice for Christi Schwundek linking the struggle against border regimes, neo-colonial extraction, super exploitation and policing to what happened to Sandra Bland and Breonna Taylor. The NSARS movement in Nigeria scandalizes the history of colonial policing in and from Europe and struggles to end it, also by moving beyond national borders. In Palestine, Freedom fighters' agitation for the sovereignty of their people made calls for liberation from Ferguson to Palestine, later calling out that they couldn't breathe as the settler colonial state of Israel rained down tear gas and bombs, much like Eric Garner suffered a brutal death at the hands of New York police, connecting what Vanessa Thompson has referred to as unbreathing to the colonial carceral conditions of these contexts and many others. Abolitionist movements and initiatives around the world have always necessarily looked towards one another, given each other transatlantic shout outs and related to one another across difference. Time and time again, we have seen activists and organizers make intentional references and connections between Oakland and Haiti, Berlin and Bahia, Tripoli to Lagos. Movements are showing us the way forward in terms of the international and international dimensions of abolitionist struggles, practices, and horizons. On the one hand, there is of course nothing new about the deeply historical movement work towards collective liberation. Abolitionist internationalism ranges from the Haitian Revolution and its reference in the Black Pacific and other parts of the world, to the revolts and rebellions of the enslaved in the Americas and the Caribbean, to the anti-colonial formations in various parts of the world and the social practices, imaginaries and narrations that oppressed and exploited people in the Quilombos, uh, developed in the Quilombos and in Maranage. On the other, given recent iterations and expressions of racial capitalism, responses have had to adapt and exceed the status quo. Still, abolitionist practices and poetics are always already in transnational conversation. Refugee collectives in Germany, especially multi-marginalized groups, draw on modes of transformative justice and alternatives from rural areas in Senegal and Gambia when developing abolitionist and communal practices. Collectives at the outer borders of Europa are in conversation with indigenous practices of commoning in West and East Africa. Um, the freedom dreams that Robin Kelly talks about and abolition poetics also go beyond colonial national containers and are further mobilized in poems, songs, and performances, smashing borders and cultural systems alike. So how do we give language to the realities of this moment, especially as they often become routinely flattened, excoriated and undermined in their mainstream retellings or in service of simplifying deep nuanced struggle and envisioning? Audre Lorde famously taught us that poetry is not a luxury. I mean, we all know that phrase, right? However, it's the remainder of this citation where we find the convergence and intention of collaboration and possibility in abolition. She continues, poetry is a vital necessity of our existence. It forms the quality of the light within which we predicate our hopes and dreams towards survival and change, first made into language, then into idea, then into more tangible action. The connective tissue between and within movements across the world and the language of abolition is the clarion call of liberation. Language, naming and action that form the sinew of collective politics and work to consistently build power through meaningful and material performances of solidarity. Uh, this is what I want us to think about as abolition poetics. 
the acknowledgement of the capacities and contours of words to change worlds when undergirded by action. And I do want to sort of underscore that part, when undergirded by action, right? And I'm saying this as someone who has certainly organized, but I'm now um, um, primarily thrust into the role of um, academic, even if I would like to disavow it. And I do want to underscore undergirded by action, um, because as much as words mean things, they do nothing um, if not met with uh, actual <laughs> material change. And we can definitely talk more about that. Thus, abolition poetics have emerged on the streets and organizing practices, on flyers, banners, and murals, in memory events as forms of wake work, in poetry events, in literature and texts, in digital fora and living archives, and are communicated in other daily, intentional, and translingual ways, meaning through, across, and beyond shared literal tongues into shared languages of liberation, freedom, and possibility. Um, so I have a bit more here, but I'm actually keen to get into the conversation bit um, about the aesthetics of abolition and the forms that they take on in their discrete geographical and historical contexts. Um, but suffice it to say, in all of these contexts that I mentioned earlier, Black people rendered migrants and refugees alongside Black people who were born in, in, in these various contexts, but who are subjected to liberal notions of citizenship in their own various ways, not only struggle collectively, but also push the struggles beyond their respective contexts. Many people struggling for ab abolition today by any name, um, for example, those in the Mediterranean had to cross those necropolitical routes, were objected through Europe's neo-imperial externalizations of borders to Libya, and experienced policing and other carceral conditions, from the urban centers to the so-called domestic spaces, from the land to the shores and the sea. These struggles are not only international, the practices and poetics that emerge out of them also open new horizons as they are not simple reactions, but reconstructions, relying on abolitionist traces, abolitionist roots that are shaped by the movement and mediation of black people. Abolition invites us to imagine, which is also to say, to translate how our communities could look different if we focus on taking care of one another rather than on punishment or commitment to naming. If we breathe collective life into what Ashawn Crawley has described as otherwise possibilities, rather than holding court and overburdening abolition with semantic meaning. What would it mean, for example, if we took up a defensive translation, rather transporting the conversations around abolition and their spatialized, racialized, temporalized contexts? What if we were ready to let the word go in order to attain its aims? What if we sat with one of the biggest ideologically heavy terms of all, who, that is to say, who is we at all? Thank you. Thank you so much, S.A. Um, okay, I would like um, for the other speakers to come onto the screen, please. Okay, so now we can have a conversation. Um, I just want to start by thanking you all for those presentations. They were extremely generative and I'm you know, equally as excited as you are, S.A., to start this conversation. The first thing I guess I'd like to do is um, maybe come back to uh, Zoe and just ask um, if you have any questions or thoughts or comments just in relation to the, the next two presentations. Yeah, I mean, I think fundamentally the question of abolition is a question of citizenship and all of the kind of attendant violences and responsibilities um, that come with citizenship, right? The obligations that we have to maintain the integrity of the state, to allow for the state to function or, or to um, extend its function, right? Mm -hmm. In our kind of um, everyday enforcements of its violences. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's really what I heard the loudest in both Essay and June's presentations, right? Like thinking about the, the, the kind of stifling surveillance violences and Hong Kong and thinking about the, the, the preclusion of, of black people from the possibility of citizenship in Italy. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's also what I was kind of thinking about with this optimism, right? And thinking about, you know, won't name names, but certain kinds of popular projects that kind of think about the foundationalization of, of black people in the United States and, and the necessity of black people to be brought into the fold of citizenship when in fact, you know, that is 
antithetical mm. to the state's existence, right? Like the state has always um, sought to um, uh, to kind of to, to exclusively rather to define citizenship a particular way and kind of conditionally allow other people to access. And it's like, what does it mean to instead of kind of conceiving of new ways of 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 communalism of of community and of horizontal governance and and whatever right to continue to attempt to position ourselves as being worthy subjects um, for assimilation into empire and and just I think about what we gain when we obviously this is not to say like don't fight for rights because we obviously have to live in a world and we have to have access to resources right like Texas has just passed an incredibly draconian abortion rather anti-abortion law and there's scores of other you know unjust policies that we obviously have to fight against but for for that to be a kind of vector for 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 the end goal right of like full citizenship like seems kind of like a fool's game um and rather to kind of think about what are other avenues for sustaining life um mm -hmm. beyond the state um, and I think that that is what I'm most interested in kind of, of, of kind of digging into and kind of what are the grammars that we can use to make that incredibly difficult or what can feel incredibly difficult, right? When there, we look around, we turn on the news and it seems like everything is just so bleak. Um, mm -hmm. But how, how do we translate what feels like this impossible dream into, into something tangible? Mm -hmm. um, that I think is this kind of, my goal of translation always. June and um, Essie, did you did you want to respond, or did you have any other thoughts about um, the presentation? Who wants to go first? Anyone? Um, I I just wanted to respond kind of quickly because I think actually, like um, Zoe, your question is a really is one that I I think I've been thinking through myself because um, one thing that that I have encountered in kind of trying to have conversations with people about Hong Kong is this constant um, accusation in a way um, that uh, the grammar with which Hong Kong people have historically articulated their political ambitions is very much, you know, in that very like liberal frame of rights and universal suffrage even like that language isn't even really used in other contexts but is in Hong Kong because it's pointing to a very specific it's like um because the right to vote doesn't exist um uh like the effective meaningful right to vote doesn't exist and so you know that is that the kind of horizon that has um existed um for for most kind of mainstream opposition um politicians um and the you know, democracy movement as a whole. But actually it's precisely like kind of through engagement with um, my, my own, um, like the privilege of like engaging with abolitionist texts from, from other contexts is what has actually kind of made me be able to look past that very like narrow horizon. Um, and to actually, you know, first like understand the ways in which um, liberalism itself is a very is a flawed project and fundamentally violent in terms of its assumptions about, you know, historically who has been able or been entitled to possess rights, which is obviously the white Eurocentric figure to the expense at the expense of um, all others, but especially uh, black people and in the history of of global colonialism and imperialism. Um, but it is again also though that generative um thing <laughs> generative ideas within abolition this idea of focusing on the ways that we care for one another the ways that we can rebuild community communalism outside of those restrictive and narrow um political horizons um that is what kind of is at the heart of of what I would say is my own kind of political um, project or, or whatever vision. Um, and translation has, has helped me um, understand how I can think beyond and helped me see 
well, you know, why Hong Kong has historically been kind of, Hong Kong people have been funneled into a very specific vision, but also identified why like, there are also many communities of people in Hong Kong and many people in Hong Kong who have not fit in the, um, you know, the, the position of the good citizen because of their racialized position, their gender, their class position and how they have um, themselves reimagined other forms of existence. Um, not really, of course, not by choice because that has been their only mechanism of survival. But in that, um, you know, there is, there is something beyond kind of the liberal horizon, even if that liberal horizon is precisely what is being uh, clamped down on or, or repressed, you know, there's always something else, um, which is a hopeful um, thing um, in the context of repression of, of that avenue. Um, So I'll, I'll pick up a bit um, because June ended on hope and I think that's um, brilliant. It helps us circle back to Mani's um, opening question to Zoe because um, we can bring in um, Mariam Kaba into the conversation, right? Who constantly tells us that hope is a discipline. Um, and so this is too in response to, to Zoe rightfully pointing out how, how bleak things seem um, and, and the intentions of that. Um, that's all. I actually want to slightly pivot. <laughs> so with, with thinking about hope as a discipline, it also has, so my mind is sort of like leap, leaping around a bit because we have, you know, Mary Carver telling us that, you know, it's, so it's not, you know, like having hope is, is naive. It's, it's difficult. It's actually quite hard work. I'm also thinking then about the material work of translation, having been a translator. Um, and I just want to bring in some nerdy etymology. Right, which is the word translate, right? <laughs> so translation actually means to remove um, or bring from one place to another. And so in translation, there is always already movement. In abolition work, there is always already movement, right? So I think this kind of, um, the connection is um, etymologically linked, but it also um, opens us up to a broader set of practices um, through which we can sort of like, attend to or attach hope onto the enterprise of translating um, these terms. I also did have, you know, it wasn't a rhetorical question, um, sort of at the end, um, you know, of, of my little intervention. I, I genuinely am I'm constantly, I mean, Zoe is the old, I mean, I'm asking this question all the time, of like, who is we? Because often when we're talking about geographical context and then historical context, and we're attending to the things that um, we are born of and committed to, another way to talk about translation is born from and then born into, um, in, in some cases from one language to another, but some movements or geographies to another. Um, it, I think that's a really, really, really important question to sort of leave, have on the table mm -hmm. that I want people who are interested in abolition to, to take up. Myself as a student of abolition rather than an abolitionist, right? Because when you sort of, uh, Stuart Hall talked to us about like identities and identification and how those are different. Um, and so I try not to identify myself as, as a subject position of a cause at any, at any term. Um, the last thing I want to say etym on the same etym etymological vein is when we're talking about um, turning of, of translation, it links back to um, Zoe's work and is also present in June's work. Um, when um, I can't remember where Zoe, but you're talking about, um, well, yes, there it is. It's Greek, which makes sense. <laughs> um, uh, apocalypse, right? You're talking about apocalypse, talking about catastrophe, and you talked um, about. Um, we can give the definition again, but right, like, like the turning and shifting, and that sort of brings me into something else that I'm interested in, in being in conversation about at some point, which is another Greek word, crisis, right? Which mm -hmm. I've talked to you about before, Zoe, but you know, it also means turning point. So on the one hand, we have a, the turning point and the turning over and into of translation as a practice, the, the sedimenting of one world, which is a language, which is a context into another, but also crisis, which also goes to the bleakness that Zoe was talking to us about that we're inundated with every day. But in my work on crisis, it etymologically means a turning point. So you have translation, you have crisis, you have 
various apocalypses. You have all of these things and, and you have what many of us do or are participating in, like what June was talking about, movement, right? You have all of this fluidity. Mm. And I think we would be remiss to let go, to like unmoor ourselves to something like bleakness instead of maybe trying to orient ourselves to something like hope, which can sort of like pick up these sediments and carry us into something otherwise, something mm. elsewise possible. Um, yeah, I hope that makes some sort of sense. Yeah, absolutely. That was that was incredible. There's so much there in everything that um, everyone has said, but just to kind of pick up on what um, Essay was saying, I guess, about um, etymology. Um, like, I, I'm thinking about, like, translation and how it kind of means, in some sense, an expression of um, a sense in another language or in another context. And that movement is always present. And as you were all kind of doing a presentation, I, I was thinking about how criminality, the, the figure of the crim, the figure of the criminal, is a, in an extremely translatable context, right? That in any in every given context that we've spoken about in this conversation, an idea of the criminal exists. And so, like in in trying to work through or thinking through um, abolition in in um, uh, like in defensive translation, I'm thinking about how we also have to recognize that resistance to um, specific forms of carcerality, resistance to this I idea of the criminal also mm -hmm. exists, even if it's not named under the, the you know, category of abolition or abolitionist work. And that like um, was something that particularly struck me in June's um, presentation when you were talking about this idea of the prefigurative and this idea of not having like a formalized uh, concept of whatever but I'm like that that is that is that sense impression right it is that like remnant it is that like echo it is that this idea that no matter where we're kind of located um and uh we're always able in some way to escape the limits of a specific kind of language right and it, it takes me back to what you were saying um essay what would it mean to let the word go like what would it mean to really relinquish the power of that that conceptual frame that is always framed like quite locally right what what kind of new worlds do, does that open up that's not really a question in any way it's just a kind of you know response to throw out there to anybody who wants to come back on anything that i've just said <laughs> is it new words that we need or can we just attend to the ones that we've got mm -hmm. This is, I feel like this is the question. I, I'm, and I, I also think when we were, I don't know, Imani, if you wanna come in on this, when we were thinking about translation, we were thinking about how abolition is robust enough to, to um, survive the iterations and, and often how these conversations become about new languages or new frames. And what you were saying, Essay, about like the importance of words being undergirded by action, that to me seems to be the most pressing Thing, right like it's not so much about what we call ourselves how we how we um more than how we orientate us ourselves towards the urgency of the moment materially right like mm -hmm. it's like yeah we don't need new words we need new practices right we need yeah. we need new it, it's like so i'm thinking a lot about the the texas anti-abortion ban right i'm kind of preoccupied with that and and it reminds me of how a couple of years ago when Brett Kavanaugh was being um, confirmed, um, there were protests after he was confirmed. And mm. I was like, that's not how protest works. Like you don't protest after the thing has happened. And I'm, and I'm thinking about now, right? When we're, when crisis is, we're in this moment and I don't, maybe there was a turning point, right? But we're in this moment where it's just like, there's relentlessness to it. And there has not been a corresponding change in the ways that we interact with the kind of onslaught of the thing, right? Maybe it's, it's this way that this moment of racial capitalism is just so draining on all fronts that it becomes impossible to kind of, to, to, to kind of get your bearings but it's this matter of like, no, we don't need new ways of, 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 of describing intersectionality, right? It's like, we need new ways of mobilizing resources. We need new ways of anticipating practice and anticipating policy and, and stealing ourselves, right? So the impact is not quite 
as as disruptive as as horrific as destabilizing um mm-hmm. and i really appreciate SAA you bringing it to a hall and being like it's not the, the 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 identity that we claim to inhabit is a lot less important than kind of how we are students of this particular politic and how that mm-hmm. corresponds into how we are kind of growing this um this the, these poetics right how we're kind of growing community with one another how we're growing our notion of solidarity and how we're kind of doing things you know mm-hmm. thank you all so much i i I want to just come in here, you know, because I am thinking about this, who are the we? And I think that that's a really important question in the development of this idea of embracing a kind of translation, right? Because I also think that, and, and maybe Essa, you can uh, testify here, um, that translation can also be done badly. That there is such a thing as a bad translation, right? And what does it look like when there is a bad translation? What, what when we're thinking about abolition, you know, it might be that we could consider that to be a, a bad translation to be a kind of watering down mm. or the kind of, um, you know, ca- the, the kind of like cannibalistic force of liberalism that Bedour Lagra is speaking about um, and that you kind of, have referenced June when you're talking about liberalism as as being a kind of you know ongoing violence and so I'm thinking when we are trying to understand how to responsibly intentionally translate these ideas um, into practice but also continue to kind of translate the that language into action right as as you were talking about um, and so I, I'm thinking, you know, I think a question that comes for me is, it's not that it has to be the same meaning, um, because it, these things are meaning different things in different contexts, right? Today they mean maybe a little bit of a different thing to they to what they hopefully will mean um, at another time. Um, and so I'm I'm trying to think about if it's not the meaning that has to be kept exactly the same. Um, what what has to be kept uh, or or looked after in order to keep the integrity of abolition? Because there is also a way of talking about abolition as if it is every single revolution, and I think that 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 ends up uh, kind of collapsing these terms, collapsing these specificities, even though we know that there cannot be a revolution that is carceral. Mm. So I, I think this is where I'm, and, and this connecting to who is the we, are we actually saying that it's not about the meaning so much, but about who is doing it? Because that's also a problem for me in some ways, because then I'm in part coming up with in defense of translation, because in the UK, in this time, it's like, that's not a, a you problem, that's a US problem, right? That's not uh, your project. And it's not just, you know, agents of white supremacy in in the UK, it is also black people in the US who are claiming these as their own ideas and their own frameworks and their own cultures. Uh, Never mind the fact that they were kind of very much developed in this internationalist framework, in this very, very global framework, um, as well as in this very local specific framework. And so I I wonder if I can just throw those thoughts out and, and see what comes back. You've just floored everyone. Yeah, I mean, June, did you did you want to hop in? I don't want to take up. No, I mean, I was just. Um, it's there are such good questions, and it's. Um, I think, like one of, I mean, I will only, tr- I would, I can only try to, <laughs> to respond, kind of just based on um, what what I'm thinking about. Mm. Um, but I guess, like for me, I, I guess speaking from my own experience, um, I think I've experienced the kind of um, bad translations um, in, in, in other ways, which is kind of uh, where, where there is a complete refusal, um, I guess, to even engage with the possibility that people might uh, have kind of, you know, abolitionist critiques um, who, from Hong Kong. 
um, on the basis of, of allegiances to, to certain ideas um, about, you know, how things have developed, but um, in themselves, these, these bad translations are often kind of, um, you know, based on just not listening carefully or not engaging with, with ideas that are slightly different or even engaging with, you know, people on the ground. I'm, I'm loath to kind of um, prioritize this, this um, concept of lived experience because I also think there are like obviously um, problems when we, when we try and prioritize an idea of the authentic voice and, you know, at the expense of, of criticism and critique. But I also do, you know, that it, when, when people are, are, I guess, so arrogant as to assume that no one has ever thought about this concept in relation to this particular area, especially people who are at the sharp edge of state violence. Um, it always just kind of baffles me in the first instance and, and, and kind of worries me um, uh, in the kind of, you know, larger sense. Um, but like, I guess just to what you were saying, um, Imani is just, for me, um, I think the key to 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 that question about about what what if if anything is the the connection um, that we can make, it's that work of making clear that these designations of of criminality that you were also talking about, Lola, um, are you know specific to uh, the manifestations are specific to this the particular locale or context that it's being instrumentalized in but the systems and global structures of oppression that undergird them are the same so racial capitalism neoliberalism um the nation state as a structure that has structured the entire world through um, as a result of colonialism, imperialism, and all these kind of broader um, historical uh, forces, um, you know, we are all part of the same world, and the manifestations are are specific to where we are. But once we are able to make those connections across these different places and root them in the same critique of the global system, mm -hmm. then that actually, at least that's for me, allows for abolition to become the common grammar, I guess. Um, and also like, in my mind, I was just drawing like kind of like, you know, that um, in my mind is like connecting these dots allows the refusal that abolition embodies that hopeful refusal to be totalizing so that we can like bring it all down um, so as to rebuild um, in our specific context, but yeah. Really interested to hear what what others mm. want to respond to as well. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Jean, that's brilliant, and I I really like what you're saying about listening. I think that's the missing piece. Sorta. Of, I think we've cracked it, to be honest. Um, when people translate both, I mean, what Imani is saying is true. There are such things as bad translation, but once we say that we're already in this like weird aesthetic realm, I'm speaking like in translation, like, like translation studies, for instance, um, like translating a text. So, you know, like what makes it bad? Um, and there are several things concretely that make it bad, one of which would be bad faith. Um, and I think that, for example, like in the call that Lola and Imani have come up with, when we talk about, you know, like defund the police, what has happened to that slogan is a translation done in bad faith, um, that people who are not moving perhaps in bad faith are still um, seduced by and attached to, just like many of us are all seduced by things that do not serve us. Um, so, um, like belonging, for instance, to national paradigms, like attachment to certain um, um, notions of ideological originality or originariness, as is the case that Imani might have also been hinting at of, I don't want to say ADOS, but I guess I just have. And so I do think that, um, I've asked for my name to be changed, right, on this? They won't be watching this, it's fine. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, and so, um, I, but I do think that um, 
what June also made um, was pointing towards is also really useful um, to hold on to. Um, effectively, I'm just volleying the question back, but really um, in terms of um, what June is saying about, um, you know, <laughs> There is a line to straddle then in term, when we get into the, the mix of authenticity. I mean, I don't have any answers, but it is a line to sort of straddle, which I wonder if that's also the point, um, which is actually what I was trying to say towards the end of my little intervention that while, you know, I don't think, I think, it, you know, it's always a both and, again, with Stuart Hall, right? I think that um, there is, <laughs> you know, don't quote me on this, but there might be something to authenticity. Mm -hmm. I don't mean that it's the only thing, but there might be something, which is to say, ab you know, if you listen to the Read podcast, you know, Crystal loves to say words mean things. Words mean things. And so whoever came up with abolition first, that very first person who was like, this thing that we're doing to free the enslaved people is called abolition. That's what it all means. The first person who decided to call someone queer as a slur, right? The first person and say denigrate as a slur or just to like talk about it and now it's like written in the guardian you know, on a regular basis like it doesn't mean to blacken like i'm supposed to read it with my black face and my black ass and not have problems like words mean things and we can take it and we can say oh it means this and over time and over historical context and when we say it in portuguese it means this when we say it in twee it means that but there is some sedimentation to translation that's what I was trying to, thank you for helping me tease that out too in, in this conversation. It's not just a carrying over in the sense of like, I pick it up from A and now it's all B. I mean, translation in a Glissantian sense. I mean, translation in a migratory sense of like, you're bringing a bit of what was there over here now. And so we cannot then just say like abolition only in this context, you know what I mean? And so in that way is what I mean by authentic. In that way, we do have to kind of attend, listen, maybe remember that it did mean that. So for example, this is not just about people who are taking abolition and watering it down to have some carceral valences. It also means people who are taking abolition to only mean the ends of prisons and not to link it to enslavement and anti-blackness. It means yeah. people who don't remember 1492 when they're saying abolition in their mouths. Mm -hmm. And so then it means, more to Imani's point again, when people are saying abolition and they mean revolution. Mm -hmm they do mean different things. And so my, my argument or my invitation to consider what it would mean to let it go means if you mean revolution, let's go. Tell me what street to meet you out at, right? But let's not have abolition hold everyone's ideological baggage because it did mean something and it can still. And I think to your point, which I really deeply, deeply appreciate as always, like I'm thinking about like the deep political chauvinism that is wrapped up in the kind of authenticity and in the kind of like Euro Western point scoring of like, this isn't an us problem, this is a US problem, right? Because everyone is always saying it's a US problem as though no one else was a participant in the transatlantic slave trade or in African colonization or whatever. And for me, it's like this occlusion of, 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 of a kind of internationalist frame in the, in the kind of finger pointing of one problem being worse than another or one problem being the kind of particular, um, uh, the, I'm losing my words, speaking of translation, but being the kind of particular the domain of another country, um, not only kind of forecloses the necessity of political, of international solidarity, but also really prevents us from recognizing and understanding that all of these systems um, were structured internationally and are maintained internationally in the present, right? Like there was the, the how much the, 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 the anti-apartheid struggle in Zimbabwe, right? Like the fight against the Rhodesian government would have probably been a lot shorter if the, you know, Zimbabwean government was not getting tanks and guns mm -hmm. from Israel, same as in South Africa, right? Like. Donald Trump is talking about farmer, farm murders and white genocide um, that are happening in South Africa, but aren't actually happening in South Africa, right? And we're hearing the same thing in the settler colony in, in, in Australia. Um, when we're talking about NSARS and when there were all of these conversations about anti-carceral politics across the African continent, you have to remember that like basically all police forces were evolved 
out of colonial police forces, right? Mm -hmm. Like the Zimbabwean National Police were literally Rhodes paramilitary in British, mm -hmm. um, British South Africa company. Mm -hmm. So it's this real like fixation on authenticity, right? Of being like the worst, maybe the worst country to have it. And so having the most authority or like the least bad country to have it. And so being the most clear about what's supposed mm -hmm. to happen when in actuality, there are relationships between the two. When mm -hmm. Sean King and other people were being like, there aren't as many police killings in Britain. It's just like, okay, how many guns do police carry? One, two, are in custody deaths and all of these deaths on these deportation flights counting as, as, as police killings or, 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 or even being recorded on these tallies of state violence, right? I don't understand this like race to the bottom mm. when we could be, you know, when all of the things were happening in, in Ferguson and people in Palestine were offering tear gas tips, right? Like there's, I'm sorry for, I don't know why I got so worked up all of a sudden. Mm. Sorry about that. <laughs> but it's like, there's, there's so, there's such possibility for capaciousness when we learn to listen, right? And we really, the translation is so accessible actually, mm -hmm. right? There mm -hmm. are so many bad translations, but there is so much ease for good translations, for a multiplicity of good translations, rather than kind of searching for the singular most authentic one. Mm -hmm. And it's like fucking hell, guys. Mm -hmm. It's there. The I material think, is there. I think also, you know, what I'm what I'm what I also come back to is like the carceral logics have already been translated. <laughs> have been have have grown and become uh real and tangible in, in a very global Mm -mm. It, it, like like not bound by any kind of anything and so so it's very like it because also if anybody kind of goes beyond like we have to get rid of punishment they also have to look at capitalism right and have to really fully understand the like what is at stake mm -hmm. and so obviously everybody is 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 very aware of the kind of uh the translation of capitalism, if you can even think about it like that, but but if it, nobody is talking about it as something that isn't global, right? And so, if 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 as above, so below, we have to then also think about what is useful for us to translate. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm I'm like, oh wow, well, these people have been organizing um, against this specific form of violence that I also see in my context. Of course, I want to study. Of course, I want to understand more deeply how they did that and, and, and whether or not it can get me free, mm -hmm. right? And so there's also this level of like, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm asking this question and I, I'm, I'm defending my right to translate these things, but also that's kind of besides the point because we want to get past that question of whether or not we can um, and think more deeply about, about how we already are. Mm -hmm. And I think also what's what seems to be coming up from what everyone is saying is that like the materiality of the demands made under that banner is the thing that that must remain like regardless of what the context is right that words mean as, as I said words mean things because they are undergirded by action and because um, they can result in the mobilization of people, the mobilization of resource in order to live in ways that, that you know, render the nation state, prisons, policing, his, like histories of violence obsolete, right? That That's kind of what keeps coming up, what I, I think is, um, keeps coming up from what everyone is saying. And I was thinking about what you said, June, about um, no rioters, only tyranny, right? Mm -hmm. And how uh, abolition is, is also, as you also said, a politics of expansive care. And care is easy to translate, right? If we're thinking about abolition, not only in terms of what must go, but also what must be created as a kind of presencing, right? Like that's also something that is much easier to translate, right? That, that political ethic, that way of being, that like transformation of relationships between people. That is something that slips through the border so much easier, maybe than you know the the clunkier aspects of this concept or this idea, or it's um, the specifics of how it's how it can be utilized in local contexts. And so I think maybe there's a two sidedness as well to to remember this idea of like abolition abolition about um, as bringing something in line with the imagination, like bringing something that previously does not exist into being. 
um, that's something that that yeah can can and should be parcelled out as a means of getting free, as a means of rethinking organised terror, as a means of of grasping at something um, different to what we have, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting that it would be care that so easily moves and is and is translatable because I think in some ways the the things that we grow, the things that that we generate in in the face of these colonial carceral logics, right? This this all encompassing violence is perhaps the most unique thing, the most sort of bounded and and uh, specific thing because it is is so much about building relationships. It's so much about uh, how we are and and and, and the relationship, the kinds of um, yeah, ways of being that we adopt, that we kind of um, uh, allow to grow, and that feels harder to 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 kind of move. Even though you want it to kind of, you know, we we can all care and all of those things. There's something about the problem solving of that, the very tangible, slow work of of building, for lack of a better word, community. Um, Building relationships, right? That are that are anti all of these things. I think that is the ongoing work that is almost impossible to to move and parcel out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I um, started shimming shimming in my seat, Lola. I want you to say more about this, right? Because when you said like care should be the e easiest one. I mean, I immediately jumped back to think about Audre Lorde, who had to like write books on books on books to be like, here's how to care. And yeah. then what did we do? We got, you know, old Jeff Bezos. We got, um, I don't I don't know these white men's names, who, like making a, a self-care industrial complex. So people are now taking self-care days that require like a month of some other people's salaries <laughs> or, or more, right, to be accomplished, right? Everything um, uh, in its time, in its place can be, you know, uh, another like a sub definition of translation really means it also involves subsumption and integration mm -hmm. and that can happen at every turn with the things we hold most dear which is also why in addition to hope being a discipline so is vigilance mm -hmm. which is why what June said spoke to me so much and that we need to listen as well as to remember so we're not saying self-care one day reading it in 1984 when Audre Lorde wrote it you know on her cancer bed and now in 2021 it's just like well self-care day gonna get my nails done like go off though I would love to like a rouge or like a coral color but you know what I mean like we we've let it translate too far right we've let it translate in a, in a is machinery a word it is now I'm a poet um, a machine sense right where we like print and reprint and reprint we translate it like how we got the word stereotype right go put it through the copier too many times so it is unrecognizable mm. and in this way uh the thing that like Lola that that sounds sounded so true to me and then it helps me see that the mechanisms though, right? The, the specific yeah. mechanisms around it are what we need to like hold fast against. And I wonder if that, I don't know, does that sort of hold true as well for abolition, right? Yeah. Where this, like maybe this is what we've sort of been talking around in terms of even me citing <laughs> Crystal from this podcast about words meaning things. It's like, it does mean something in its own time, but of course we can take it to this other context. Or of course people have been saying or doing or experiencing or enacting the thing like what June's talking about for generations, <laughs> but we just may not have called it the same thing, right? A facsimile or a translation in that sort of way. And so I wonder then, like with abolition, like with care, abolition needs, yeah, that kind of vigilance so that we don't, I don't know if this, I don't want to put words into June's mouth. So June, tell me if this makes sense. Like anthropologize is the word that's coming to me, right? Like go to a place um, so we can say we've been there, right? But like, and no shade to, I know too many black anthropologists to like just let this go unchecked. I, I mean, a certain historical kind of anthropology and it's colonial oh, roots. Yes. Um, where you can like go to a place and be there for six months, write seven books for the rest of your career about the people, um, divorced from their actual experiences of the thing, you know, that we need to actually listen and attend and keep those vigilant walls up of that content so we can actually have the ease that Lola talked to us about shine through because otherwise 
racial capitalism is a global phenomenon and none of us are immune, like, right? We're not outside of capitalism, um, or at least not any of us on this call. I'm on a MacBook, you know what I mean? Like, anyway, sorry for rambling. I'm just saying like these, the things, the ease that Lola talked about and the ease that Zoe talked about, I wonder if the things themselves are easy, then we have to attend to the other things that are um, dissolving them, mm. partying them and making them uh, apparate and appear elsewise. And I think, I appreciate, so I'm just thinking back to what you've just said about bad translation. And I'm wondering, because right, we've, we've seen so many things be poorly translated, right? Like we just lost decolonize, <laughs> you know? And so I wonder if it's not Make so much, rest in peace. you know, just pour, where's, pour one out. But it's just like, <laughs> I wonder if it's not a bad translation, but it's this deliberate, mistranslation um, as neutralization, right? Like a recognition that a thing is potent. Mm. And so there are these deliberate um, unravelings mm. um, because we saw how quickly, how quickly and how particularly decolonized became diversity and inclusion as soon as it became mm. a part of the kind of liberal academic lexicon, right? Mm. We saw how quickly in front of Kimberly Crenshaw's salad, they've done the same thing with intersectionality, as though the person who created the term was not very particular about the context from which the term emerged. Yeah. And, and it's not to say that it can't be used in other, any other way, right? But she's, she's very specific about like, these are the origins. And then it's no surprise that shortly on the tail of this misappropriation of, of, of intersectionality, we now have that full on state war against critical race theory mm. of which intersectionality is, is a part, right? But within the kind of uh, critical legal theory. So I don't, with, maybe I'm, I'm just coming around to, and I've just been sitting with this idea of, of bad translation, right? And I'm pushing back against it to say, it's not a bad translation. It is a purposeful translation um, that, you know, it sees it's it sees its target. It drones its target and does it ends mm -hmm. clears it out of the way. And I think as you were as you were talking just to come in like really quickly, I was thinking about that thing Joy James says about the, the role of the state being to like mystify violence. And like that's what we're we're seeing. Like we're we're seeing the ways that like um this this idea of potency that you brought out, it's like what are we going to do about the government agencies that you know are rolled out to to neutralize threats right and and to muddy movements to make organizing as diff as difficult as possible in terms of surveillance that is uh, the means through which um abolition becomes meaningless right or gets lost in translation or that is the way that we see that like across contexts um yeah the, the role of the state really is to is to obscure what is the, the clarity that underpins the material demands of abolition, right? I just wanted to, yeah. to add that to what you were saying. And where you say the state, we can also say the university, because as we were talking about these terms, I've seen many a job call for decolonial studies. I'm no shade to my department of gender studies, but since we were talking about queer earlier as one of the terms that have like been moored and unmoored, right? There's a queer bank now all of a sudden, a queer visa card that you can get. And when there's backlash from, uh, from queer people, um, political organizers and such, they're like, we're just queers. It's a queer owned establishment, right? And there's queer stuff. I mean, we can talk, it's, a, it's another conversation. I know we might be on time, but the, that's the vigilance that I think, you know, really does, is something that we can like hold on to, you know, in our other conversations in the future, because the things itself are present, right? Que like queerness means something, blackness means something. You know, there's a lot of Britain on the call, yeah? Somerset House, we can talk about how black was tried to, you know, we can put, shape, take the word abolition from Lola and Imani, your, your, your call, your intervention and put black in there in terms of like, it could mean this and it could mean that depending on the context. And we know who has made those arguments and tried to bring 1980 into 2021 mm -hmm. to sort of undermine the presence and prescience of black African people. And so I do think that, yeah, these things are always you know, in concert and mm -hmm. the vigilance, I mean, maybe this is just like a self own as an educator at a, in, in a university setting, right? To think about, um, if hope is a discipline to take down also like disciplinary formations, 
that also keep us like both divided and perpetuate that uh, neutralization that Zoe so rightly talked to us about, Dr. Samudzi. <laughs> Um, I have one thing to say, which is just like a small reflection on that. I don't think we have time to fully go into it, but I think it can lead us to maybe a closing conversation. So one of the things that's, that maybe is, is interesting is just specifically speaking about the, the phrase intersectionality um, and thinking specifically about Kimberly Crenshaw as somebody who has, you know, like, uh, coined that term and thinking that there's not actually a, a comparison even though we could argue that there, that there is there's not so much a comparison with abolition it's not like it was this one person's term that they coined that she coined that she then you know uh, really revolutionized a, a field with and so, like, I'm thinking with, you know, the, the field of legal scholarship, like, it had very tangible effects. And I'm not saying that abolition hasn't had tangible effects, but there isn't one definition. And that's what is exciting about it and challenging about it and also allows for it to be as capacious as I think that we are kind of thinking about it. And it doesn't mean that it doesn't not mean something very specific, but there is also uh, scope to evolve, inform, uh, play with definition or, or abandon definition um, without abandoning these, these, these singularities, uh, without abandoning what it means. And I think there's something really nice about the collectivity of that task and the uh, sort of um, practical nature, right? Like we have to do the 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 learning the studying the uh defining uh with our actions and so i'm, I'm i wanted to kind of go around a little bit and and give people a chance to say final things um and also to speak to maybe uh yeah this this idea of there being a kind of definition or not um of this term of this way of being Lola, do you? Okay. <laughs> and then someone else will go. Um, yeah, I think, I don't know, there was so much kind of um, in what you said. And I think maybe what, what to, to, to provide actually a closing thought yeah. and closing idea, I was thinking not only of hope as a discipline, but um, of, of determination as a principle, right? Like when you were talking about nihilism at, at the beginning, Zoe, um, I, I, was, I was really interested how you said that or implied that it doesn't preclude a, uh, a trying, right? It doesn't preclude um, determination. And I think that that, that is, e even if you are attentive to the multiple disappointments of this world of, of racialized violence, of, you know, terror, of terror, essentially, um, the thing that you were saying about the things that are built and the moments that are created when we resist together or when we use language in ways that that is able to shift our conception of possibility which i think the language of abolition does in lots of interesting ways Th that that then to me is is the um, a kind of practical application of the determination that we will need in order not only to survive but to to touch taste feel to sense freedom right and that to me is like um, that's why I'm. Uh, that's why I'm taking most from this conversation. I think that the, the that if language is powerful, if, if we must kind of compare it to action, whatever, it is o only powerful if it's imbued with that that determination, right? That means something. That means a physical change. That means a physical kind of shift. I guess. Mm. This is my final response. Yes, I, I fully agree with that. And I think the thing I, the, the only thing that I have to say about thinking about what is kind of abnormal definitionally is like there are a lot of like bad explanations of what it is, like people turning police abolition into defunding and that being the only thing. But I think the beauty of it is that just like, you know, what it is as a practice, like its definition is necessarily collective and comprehensive. 
responsive and iterative and reiterative. Um, mm. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Um, I mean, I just like first just thank you. I've gained so much from this this conversation and being in conversation with you all. Um, just to to what you were saying, Amani, I think, and this is, I mean, basically what what Zoe presentation like it's it's kind of been replaying in my head because I think above all like abolition kind of if in thinking about it it is this um ethic of of refusal um as well as care and I guess in terms of if we wanted to to figure out a definition it is that practice of identifying what are we refusing what are these categories? What are these structures? What are these global forces that, that we are pinpointing our opposition to and our resistance towards? And then you know, building very practically from that um, refusal. Yeah. Um, and I think, yeah, just echoing what, what others have said, I think there is something just fundamentally really, really beautiful about the fact that it has to be collective because the only way you can you know, define something as if you come up against it, or if you see others coming up against it in ways that are dissimilar, but rooted in the same kind of broader structure, the wall, the wall, you know, juts out in different ways, and, you know, lowers in certain areas and hurts people more than other people. But fundamentally, it is that wall that um, we're all trying to shake and bring down. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That's kind of my inelegant metaphor to end, um, but yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you all so much. So excited to be the last. What? I was trying not to, but June scooped me. Um, <clears throat> yeah, all of these definitions sound great. I think we're also you know, in pra a practice of, of coalition, um, which is important to abolition as we collectively try to define it. Um, I would say uh, at its most direct, um, this is the thing too, when we're thinking about abolition and translation, I realized, did we say the word prison enough? You know what I mean? <laughs> like, but you know, it's, it's fundamentally to do with a vision um, to end imprisonment and prisons. I'm gonna hold that there and say, <laughs> it also is to do, you know, this is, you know, coming from Ruth Wilson Gilmore, Ruthie Gilmore, who talks about abolition as about presence rather than absence, right? So it is to do with the ends of prisons, but also then establishing and um, amplifying communities of care that will allow us to, us, plural collectively to thrive um, without such structures as prison, carceral structures um, that persist to punish and prevent care from existing, right? And so I think that um, they go together, right? When we name the um, desire, because it also fundamentally is about desire um, for some things end, we also have to name the thing that we want to persist and to, in some cases, exist. And abolition um, straddles that line, which is, I think, what makes the conversation um, in translation and that we've had today so generative, because we're trying to straddle that in our respective geopolitical and historical contexts. Thank you so much. That was incredible. It's been, this conversation has been so rich. Um, and I thank you to everyone who's also watching. I'm sure the audience members will have taken away um, incredible things from what you said. Um, please do keep an eye out on the rest of the program um, th that is on the Som uh, Somerset House um, Studios um, website. But um, yeah, thank you so much. <laughs>